Welcome to the Gym Life Podcast. Join one of the Gym Life Podcast. My name is Mike Mackerlane, president, and that guy up there, Dr. Jim Stepani's business partner, and uh, also Milos Sarshev. And Milos is one of our partners and a gym. I don't even want to call you like a gym athlete because I think that uh, doesn't underscore, um, you know, kind of like your importance to one of some of the things that you do. But this is the first time that I think the three of us have sat down this capacity. And uh, I'm like a fly on the wall just because with Jim, first of all, if you guys don't know, um, there he's more than, I think, an expert in the field of sports nutrition, supplementation, fitness. Um, he's done so much and just uh, I, I'm honored to always be on with Jim. And then Milos, with your credentials of what you've done in your past, I'm just absolutely honored to be on with you guys. And so my goal today is to just stimulate the topics and some of the conversation that maybe uh, the listeners can um, kind of take away hearing from you guys. So uh, thank you both. So Jim. Milos, yeah, thanks, thank Mike. And, and one thing I want to say about Milos is uh, for those of you who who may be too young to know his true background, but um, when I was coming up as an amateur bodybuilder, uh, Milos is one of the pros that I really uh, looked up to um, uh, and, and he's a personal hero of mine. So uh, it's always, always a pleasure uh, to be on. Uh, with Milos. So thank you, Milos. Okay, thank you, Jim. And uh, I, I'm going to say this for also people that don't know, that haven't seen you compete, Jim. Uh, I might be professional. You didn't go that far. You went just in the uh, amateur stages, but you created the physique that is equally as impressive as mine or anybody else that competed. Oh, well, no. <laughs> thank oh, yeah, you. Yeah. But... <laughs> you. You did have a... Maybe uh, close. Uh, maybe, maybe. Maybe listen, I was getting it, but that, uh, that that's a, a huge honor coming from you. So thank you. I, I'm serious. And I encourage uh, Mike Molnar and anybody there to dig out some pictures and videos and maybe put it on the side for them to realize and recognize beauty, shape, aesthetics. I mean, who wouldn't want to look like that? But I'm going to fast forward to today. Who wouldn't want to look like you at this stage of your life? I mean, uh, I was known for being uh, in shape year round. I competed in maximum amount of shows, 110, 72 as a pro. I was always in shape. But uh, what you are showing me, your low level of body fat, your muscularity at this age, I mean, it, it's amazing. So uh, hat is off, you know, and, uh, and uh, I really want to tell you that I appreciate and respect it. But uh, people criticize me that I talk too much at once. But I just, I, I must say this because you guys introduced me and I want to introduce Mike as well. Uh, and Jim from a different aspect. I was a Weider athlete since 1991. Joe Weider, father of bodybuilding, uh, Muscle Fitness Flex magazine editor, uh, the, the true uh, initiator of bodybuilding movement here in, in the States. And you can probably uh, see some photos of him behind me here. Behind, yeah. And, and we all love him and respect him. Uh, he made Mr. Olympia, brought Arnold Schwarzenegger and, and everything else. So... Joe Weider employed these two gentlemen that, that are now, you know, my partners and I'm so proud of. And uh, uh, from early on, I've uh, uh, trapped that the Dr. Jim Stefani, okay, is a PhD and it's expert. And he's speaking in a terms of science, but also has a other view, his personal view and uh, going outside the box. And we're going to do this uh, later with the with the uh, gym supplements um, ingredients and amounts that you were putting on, you know, some, something that is liberal and your own, your examination and your realization. This is what we need. Science says this, but you use the science, you try on yourself, and then you see, oh, this is actual value that we should be using. And uh, I'm, I'm saying this because you see. When you have a, a your title and authority, it's much heavier because I'm always going to be bro scientist. 
you know, because I, I don't have a really uh, a PhD, you know, behind my name. So they're going to say, Milos, you're just one of those that experiments and all the stuff. And yes, but uh, when you apply the science and knowledge that you have, and then your personal experience, you can bring the supplements like you did. And I take my hat off to you because I was saying to Mike, first time I've seen him, if I would uh, uh, formulate some of the supplements, it would be pretty much identical to what Dr. Jim already did. I have a couple of other things in mind, but uh, I haven't seen anybody in industry around the world. I had a supplement line in uh, Spain back in the day. I had it twice in the uh, United States. I traveled the world. I haven't seen a supplement line that has a, such a potent, effective uh, supplements like you formulated. Well, thank you, Milos. Thank you so much. Yeah, I, I honestly mean that. But uh, as we're going to discuss practical things, okay. So I'm going to tell you this very briefly. I pride myself for being raised by uh, one of the most brilliant men I know, my father, uh, Dr. Science of Nara Sakachi, who from very beginning, you know, uh, started to ridicule my, my approach to the bodybuilding exercise physiology, nutrition, hypertrophy methods. And he opened up my mind a little bit more into like, he said, listen, science is science, okay. You can take in consideration recommended daily allowances for what I tell you, but then you can also think, who are they recommending that to? I, do you belong in that bracket? Does a football player, weightlifter, bodybuilder, and average Joe uh, have a same RDA, right? right. And, and this is uh, because I think one of the topics that we're going to uh, talk today about, sorry, Mike, uh, jump on it, uh, it would be a, amount of protein, right? Precisely. So uh, yep. from the very beginning, uh, I'm from Yugoslavia, so over there was, you know, per, per kilo, here is per pound. Uh, maximal daily uh, allowance would be 0.36 grams per, per pound or 0.8 per kilo. And this is, this is like uh, recommended. So of course, me training for, for uh, hypertrophy in the first three months, training like a maniac and, and having almost zero results. Uh, so like, well, you know, there is something wrong. It's either my training or my nutrition. And uh, that's what my father said, are you sure you have enough protein? I said, well, by the books, I do have it, but uh, you know, maybe I should, I should need a little bit more. And I was always uh, under the impression, just double it. So I really, since the very beginning, I doubled my amount of protein. And this is how I start growing and initiating you know, my hypertrophy and, and growth. So I don't know if, uh, uh, Mike, you want to say, ask something specific about yeah. that? So let's kind of get into it. It's funny you say that because mm -hmm. uh, uh, this is in 2000. <clears throat> yeah, uh, I just want to, I just want to go back to your point about whether you fit in that bracket, you know, as a scientist, when I give advice based on research studies, you know, a lot of other experts will quote a study and say, well, they found this and uh, they never did real research, you know, uh, you know, I, I graduated from University of Connecticut, did my postdoc at Yale University School of Medicine, I was a real research scientist. So I'll go back and look at the study and be like, these were college kids, and, and right. they'll claim that they're trained, but look, I've dealt with college age kids. They'll do anything for 20 bucks that, you know, they're paying them, they'll, they'll claim that they work out regularly, and uh, regular to them isn't you know regular so a lot of times the research that's being done sadly doesn't apply to the people that follow uh milos and myself and want that want that advice because they're literally training consistently and so you have to sometimes take that research with a grain you know everybody thinks research is up on this pillar and every study proves something. That's not always the case. There are many, many flawed studies. Anyway, I just wanted to, to uh, yeah. sort of touch on what you were, you were mentioning. But Mike, go ahead. Uh, sorry yeah. to keep cutting I you mean, off. <laughs> well, no, it's fine. You know, so so here's, here's the reality for anybody who might uh, watch and listen to this. Is, is this basically right here is um, kind of 
the, the, the pinnacle of where people could get and source information prior to the internet and prior to social media. And this is one of the biggest problems that I have with what's going on today. And I need, I need both of you guys to kind of help um, articulate some things because as Milos says, you know, I wouldn't classify you as a bro scientist at all, Milos, in terms of the bro science, yeah. um, you know, because exactly. real, science, real science can be articulated by somebody who can actually see what real science says. And as what Jim says, sometimes the real science, you have to have somebody who's credible enough to understand, well, I looked at this study, but it doesn't have any practical application in the real world. Right. And Jim and I've I've spent my 20 years with this man, uh, you know, learning and, and, you know, my background is not, you know, I'm a sports medicine and kinesiology guy, but they don't teach you supplementation. And I came into working with Jim for this magazine when I was 22 years old. And there you at least had something to go if you were a new kid or somebody who wanted to get involved in fitness, you could go to this and for the most part, get good information, especially during the time that, you know, Dr. Jim Stepani was there. And, and Jim has been saying these things. And he said, this is in 2005. I just read an article in here where guess who, who vetted all of these products in here. And this was back in 2005. So the ultimate supplement protein buyers guy. Okay. And what, and who went in through here and basically broke it all down in terms of, you know, the, the, the serving size, the amount uh, grams per serving, and, and then gave you a summary of what to take. And to your point, Milos, most people don't even understand how much protein they actually need to take. And so when you have systems and organizations like this that have now gone away, and then bodybuilding.com was the internet sensation that everybody went to. At least there you would get some good information from. In, in large in part, you ran into Jim there. You ran into Jim in the magazine. You know, you have Milos. You even had your application within the magazine of getting information out there. Same thing with bodybuilding.com. Well, now we have social media where every real bro scientist who is spinning a bunch of BS in the marketplace is now just littered the industry and littered the landscape with bad information. So my first question is, if you want to go ahead and train, and if you want to go ahead and build muscle, you probably need to take a protein shake, right? So two questions. One, what type of protein should you take and how many grams per day should you be getting based on that macronutrient? Okay. So, so for, just uh, to, to jump on something that you said, because you, you just show uh, the research, you know, the, the, uh, Jim was saying about research, and then he mentioned uh, it could be old, elderly woman or teenage, uh, the pencil necks and, and stuff like that, right? It's not appropriate uh, a subject to be tested. But uh, what I've seen, and this is in the supplement industry, that Dr. Jim Stepani stepped on it and stopped that nonsense, is... Uh, back in the day, uh, I was involved with um, uh, Bill Phillips. Bill Phillips was uh, uh, in Matrix and then went to EAS and Myoplex. And, and he is the guy that he would you know, mention openly, give me the research study and I'm going to uh, sell, excuse my language, if I could say a uh, dog shit. They don't know what is it and how much they need to take. But if I have a research study, I can sell that, right? So just put the soap in my eyes. Tell me what I want to hear it, and I'm just going to blindly follow. This is what Jim stepped in and said, listen, you want to make a difference from every aspect, muscle building, energy, focus, in endurance, all that stuff. This is what is going to make a difference, okay? And this is how much you need to take to feel the difference, okay? This was never discussed before. So now, to answer your question, say about the protein. I started my uh, uh, talk about... Protein is most essential, most important. The protein, 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 protein. Since I was a kid, since I was a teenager, I was obsessed with the protein. Most important, only building nutrient of the body, broken down into peptides and then down to amino acids. And now these amino acids are going to be storing uh, in each and every tissue that we need. So we have a physiological need, like every 
grandma I was saying and a teenager okay we all have these physiological needs but athletes have a dramatically increased protein intake especially resistant training hypertrophy driven strength athletes we need much more how mu how much more so here it is this is this is why uh, i said i consider myself bro scientist because uh, uh, i i don't have a double blind university study and i can give you the paperwork now oh here it is you need uh, two grams or three grams per kilo and stuff like that so i i don't have that uh, i i think that if the gym you you probably uh, read so much more research than uh, I did. And uh, you, know, you can probably uh, uh, say this right after me. But just to conclude for you, Mike. So protein, if taken by uh, solid foods, which every doctor, every scientist would say, yeah, you don't need uh, any chemicals and supplements you just need a solid food i mean this is how it's been for, for so is, is protein powder chemicals no but but you see for an average most for an average people most protein, people think that when you take a protein powder you're taking a chemical jim is that right i mean you're correct chemicals and the, the truth is it's simply food right simply food it's just yeah. another form it's just another form of, of food, whether it's milk, right? If we're talking about milk proteins like whey or casein, uh, if we're talking about egg protein, right? It's it's, it's just concentrated food yeah. uh, when we're talking about protein powders, right? I think this is so important. And uh, Mike, I'm gonna tell you this because I travel around the world. When I went to Serbia and I had my protein powders and the costumes goes, oh my God, all these chemicals, all these chemicals. I right. go, I, I go to the TV show and say, oh, you're not taking this like concentrate like they are putting uh, into the, the chickens and all the stuff like you, you are not eating these chemicals, you know, you eat solid food. I say, no, as a matter of fact, if you're going to take your solid food for a protein reasons, but as a, a bonus plan, you're going to get so much more fat and so much more other things that you didn't really need. So if you are shooting for 50 grams of protein, and you're going to take 250 grams, let's say, of any kind of chicken, turkey, fish, beef, meat, whatever, solid uh, protein source, you're going to get so much more, what you don't need, so much more fat. And how fast do you think that protein that you took will digest and you're going to get those amino acids available readily for when you need it, what you intend them for? Here, we have a protein powders, right? There is defected protein, extracted only what we want. So that for the same 50 grams of protein that you're going to have from there, you're going to take no added bonus fat that you didn't want. And uh, uh, and you're going to get it available. Depends which protein. If you take a whey protein or you take casein. Or, uh, in 25 minutes, 40 minutes, one hour. So you're going to have everything that you want much faster, sooner, and available instead of here. So they say, like, oh, so you're saying this is better than solid food? I say, like, listen, there's 24 hours in a day. Uh, my goal for all my athletes, for all my relatives, for all the people that are listening, I would want to establish constant if influx of amino acid in a, in a bloodstream 24 hours a day. So we have uh, all the valuable essential amino acids always. Brain needs it, enzyme needs it, hormone needs it. Muscle needs it, it's there. When there is a protein requirement and essential amino acid need for whatever tissue to be made and it's missing, uh, muscle tissue is uh, on the last list of preference. So everything else is going to get it. Muscle is going to uh, be the last one on the list. So for me as a muscle builder, right, if I would say I cannot compromise and have at any moment during a day that maybe my uh, muscle protein synthesis need some amino acids and they're missing. You know, so uh, on that note, I would supply sufficient amount of protein throughout the day and ensure constant influx of amino acids. So if I have this, I'm very, very peaceful that I'm not going to compromise my growth and I can maximally uh, increase my muscle mass if I do the right things throughout the day. Yeah, and getting back to your point about people think 
you know, Whole Foods is better. Sure, yes, okay. Uh, generally speaking, Whole Foods are going to give you more uh, vitamins and minerals, right? Other micronutrients, including the macronutrients that you need. But like you said, when you're trying to maximize muscle growth and you're trying to get in over a gram of protein per pound of body weight, and that's what Mike's original question is, how much you need a minimum of a gram per pound of body weight, even up to one and a half and even up to two grams, depending on where you are. Um, um, but you, if you tried doing that with say, you know, milk or, or whole food all the time, A, it's hard to eat that much food. Um, and, and B, you're going to be over on your fat macros you're gonna, and, and you're going to gain body fat. Sure. You'll gain muscle at the same time. And then there's other, there's people that say, well, it's so expensive protein powders. I actually did an article comparing the cost of milk to the cost of at least my protein powder pro gym and per gram of protein, the protein powder is cheaper than buying the milk. <laughs> You know, because you're only getting about eight grams of protein per cup of milk, you know. So at the end of the day, it's a lot of milk to reach, you know, what you need um, for uh, for your protein needs. So um, it's, you so know. I, re I, I, yeah. remember, I remember that article, Jim, and, you know, I was trying to, like, get a little prepped here because this is stuff you've been writing about for 20 plus years. So I'm, if I'm, you know, a 200 pound individual, you're saying get anywhere between three to 400 grams per day. Yeah. Minimum and, of 200 minimum of and, minimum. Now, why would I want to get that? Cause that's just what you need to build muscle. Yes. So if I want to build muscle, I need to be getting minimum 300 grams to 400 grams, give or take minimum 200. Yeah. You need at least a gram, right? And, right. and, and the, the other, the other, there's a few other things here to mention is that if you, you also can cycle your, you know, there's talk about cycling your protein because what happens is if you're eating, let's say two grams per pound of body weight, so you're 200 pounds, you're eating 400 grams. Eventually what happens is your protein efficiency goes down. And so it takes you even more protein to get the same boost in muscle protein synthesis. So there's some thinking, uh, you know, and, and again, there's no research on this, that you might want to have periods maybe on off days where you're eating lower protein just so that your protein efficiency goes up. Um, and then to continue on that, people will argue and say, well, well, you know, there's, there's no real research showing that higher protein leads to get great, greater muscle gains. You know, uh, there's there's research showing that it that it doesn't make a difference, and like tr that's very true. There is research showing that when you compare a low protein diet to a higher protein diet, they didn't really see much change. But again, it gets back to the subjects, who the subjects were, uh, you know, and what they were doing for their workouts. Because a lot of times, the workouts that these research scientists, and again, I'm a research scientist, but I'm a bodybuilder, okay. Uh, I've worked with a lot of research scientists. They don't know a damn thing about what a, a real workout is. And so they're the ones who create these workouts for their subjects and they're not real workouts. They'll, they'll go in and do three sets of pull downs followed by three sets of leg press followed by three sets of the bench press. And I'm like, I'm sorry, that's not a workout that's going to stimulate muscle growth to begin with. So it didn't matter how much protein that they were eating. It, you're neither one of them are going to see decent gains with that workout. I'm sorry. So it gets back to, again, you know, you have to understand the research. You have to understand the subjects. You have to understand the modalities that were used. What did the workout look like? If it's a half-ass workout, it doesn't matter. Um, but there are plenty, if you look at the research and you understand the research and you find the good studies, there are plenty of studies that are, um, Many have been done by people who are, um, who are involved in the International Society of Sports Nutrition, okay? Meaning they have a clue about eating for athletes and the athlete's specific goal. We're not talking about a marathon runner here, right? We're talking about, about a bodybuilder. But if you look at the proper research studies, there's research showing that going up to one and a half grams per pound of body weight in protein will produce greater gains uh, in, in muscle growth. And there's another thing that's been found was it's called <clears throat> protein spread. 
okay? When you compare a low-protein diet to a high-protein diet, what was the difference? It, it needs to be a big enough spread to show a difference in the high protein. So a lot of times they'll claim a low protein versus a high protein diet. Well, the high protein diet wasn't even a gram of protein per pound of, but that's not a high protein. It's not, it's not a big enough spread to show a difference when you do the research. Plus the other difference is what was the subject eating prior to going on a high protein diet. And again, this gets back to that protein efficiency that I was saying. When you're eating high protein, right, your efficiency goes down, so you need more protein. So if you're looking at not just comparing different subjects on different diets, but if you do a a study where you take a subject and you put them on a low-protein diet, then you switch them to a high-protein diet, the the high-protein diet has to be, like I said, again, a big enough spread to actually see uh, a difference. And so that's why the re when you look at the research and if you read a, re- a review by somebody who doesn't understand, uh, bodybuilding and, and, and strength athletes, they'll say, well, there's mixed reviews on whether high protein. No, no. If you look at the right studies, the ones that are done right actually do show in fact that anybody who's interested in more muscle mass or more strength needs a higher protein diet. And when I'm talking about a higher protein diet, I'm talking at least a gram and upwards to one and a half to even two grams uh, per pound of body weight, depending again on that subject. I, I would circle that, I swear to God, because I said the identical words to Dr. Jim, one gram is a minimum for a humankind. One gram per pound is minimum for a uh, humankind. For, for anybody, not for, not not for anybody walking around. Just one gram minimum for a humankind. Yes, yeah, so if you yeah. want it, if you want to be lean, have maximum yeah, health, yeah. you know, Just quality of life. Athletes. Agreed. Exactly. <clears throat> athletes one and a half, and strength athletes, bodybuilders, hypertrophy uh, looking athletes would be at two grams per pound. And exactly. I'm gonna tell you. Uh, I have here just it happened like those were my journals, uh, and I, I this is 1996 and I say every single day and this is how I used to do I there was no it was a Polaroids but every day this is how much protein how much carbs here was four seven four hundred seventy protein four forty carbs four hundred ten protein three thirty carbs any day that you would take I was making sure that I was having four hundred four hundred fifty even up to 500 grams. I had these journals from 87 to 2003. And this is my double blind university study on a bodybuilder. I tried, okay, what is gonna happen? I don't need that much protein. I'm just gonna, you know, go, you know, one and a half. And I trained the same. I I replaced my calories I lost from protein with a little bit extra carbohydrates. So I would be in a caloric requirement that I thought so I need daily, but reduce protein. I would always lose size. I promise you this. And then every time when I bring back that protein, here we go. So uh, I didn't read the study, right? But just like Dr. Uh, Jim said it right now, it's like music to my ears. One and a half and two grams of protein per pound. Yes, this is what I would always say. But if I said, and some doctor would listen, but Milos, too much protein, it could be, you know, renal toxicity. Dangerous. Can, yeah. Renal no. Yeah? No. no. If, no. You, if your kidneys are compromised, sure. If you have kidney issues, yeah. okay. okay. So, but for a, a healthy adult, that's what the kidneys are there for. <laughs> I said to that uh, uh, every time in the seminar, and I was asked 20 times minimum, find me a single study of a healthy individual with no renal toxicity, what would be toxic level of protein? There's not one that I know of. So maybe uh, Dr. Jim knows. So these myths, I mean, I'm really uh, tired of it. What is really missing in today's society in 21st century? Now, what you see, what is happening? Uh, younger generations, besides losing the muscle mass, being less manly, less muscular, less athletic and strong, right? It's like, oh, we need muscle and we need uh, muscularity, like high level of testosterone, right? Man should be a man with uh, uh, athletic, strong muscle. 
and you need to train. I mean, I would make training mandatory for every human being. I mean, we are kind of, I know I'm going to touch the, you know, few uh, nerves when I say it, but why do we allow people to be lazy? Why do we allow them to make a choice? Well, just physical culture for me, it's, I, I don't need it. Yes, you do. Uh, need it. Yeah, I, and, and I think I think that's representative in a lot of the cultural stuff. And so that's but I but I will say that what I see, because I talk with a lot of people, especially a lot of the young guys. So there are um, there's a couple uh, really high level trainers who train some of the some of the, the local athletes here in, in Westlake and they come in. And so I talk to these kids all the time, these 16, 17, 18 year old kids and and um, there is a thirst for knowledge, though, because and that's what I'm saying about this doesn't really exist anymore. Yeah, there's no there's no institutions any longer that no. you can go to and rely on consistent information. You know, at, when I was a senior science editor at Muscle and Fitness, like you said, I filtered everything to make sure that it gelled with our consistent messaging to the reader so that it wasn't just a flip flop. You know, you, you, you pick up another fitness magazine that wasn't one of ours. Right. And you'd see on the cover, um, you know, eat, you know, the best diet is no carbs. And then the next month it says, Oh, if you go no carbs, you're going to die, you know? And so they give these mixed messages. Uh, and when I was at, at Weeder, the thing that, you know, my number one job other than what was teaching people stuff was to keep the messaging consistent with our core message. And without those, like you said, without the muscle and fitness magazines, without the bodybuilding.coms, you no longer have those consistent institutions, if you will, that are giving that message. And so now people just get in their social media. Oh, what is this guy saying today? What is this guy saying today? What is this other guy saying? And it's just flip flop. And so, the the confusion now, you know, there like you said when 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 I started doing social media in in YouTube and Facebook uh, and Twitter, there was no Instagram, there wasn't even a Twitter at first. There was just the uh, YouTube and Facebook. There were a, a handful of us who were giving out the information. Now that spawned literally millions of fitfluencers you know, all over the place. And so now, you know, before you'd have to go buy a magazine or go log on to a website to get information. Now it's just pumped on your phone all day long in your face. But the problem is, 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 is it's easier to get the information. The information is all over the place and you, you, you can have a 16 year old kid telling you what to do. And it's just like, you, you really want to listen to it somebody who's been working right. out for a year, he's really figured right. it. He's really figured out what you need to do nutrition wise and training wise to actually produce results. That's who you're, you're going to listen to, or a person who took a weekend course, uh, on, on training, you know, it, it is going to tell you, you know, how to train. You, you want to make sure that you're getting your information from reliable sources who've been doing it for, you know, for a long time. And, and what's really crazy to me is, you know, as I get old, I'm 55 now, right? The ageism on social media is crazy. People will say things to me like, oh, shut up, old man. What the hell do you know? Whereas in other cultures, you know, if you look at like more Asian cultures, the older the person, the wiser they are, and the more you tend to listen to them. In America, it's the opposite. Oh, I, I'm going to go listen to the 20-year-old with the blue eyes and the 22-inch biceps because he's going to tell me what I should be eating. And it's just like, okay, <laughs> go, right. you know, go for it. But I feel sad. You know, I, I really feel sad for the people that are growing up in this age because, like you said, it's hard to get that consistent information and the correct information. Well, and that's, and that's the reason why I think it's important that we don't stop the, the, the work to try and, and, and sit down with you, Jim, and, and, you know, you too, Milos, and then my job to make sure that your messages get out there in the best way possible. And, you know, we use, um, you know, the, the Fitfluencers too, but there's a little bit different of a process with our approach. It's not to try and find people with just range and reach. But it's to find people who can actually help, you know, 
uh, cultivate the message. Spread that the proper been, word, right. Exactly, you know, and, yeah. and put them into terms in which get their uh, audience to understand that because, um, you know, these things are important. I mean, you know, getting just the right information about how much protein to take is important. And there's there's a, a, a very uh, opinions out there to Milish's point about, well, you know, I the, only the bodybuilders and the guys stepping on stage are taking that chemical powder at two gram, you know, like it's just bad. It's, it's, it's really misinformation. Um, and, and it's, and it's sad. And, and I guess my next question is, you know, uh, kind of two questions. One, you know, we talk about supplementing with uh, protein powder to help offset the amount of, you can never eat in a normal balanced diet, real food to get the optimal amounts of, of protein throughout the day. If you want to build muscle, right? We've established that. What should that amount be? between one to two grams, you know, within the range per pound of body weight. But is there a specific time that's probably best to take a protein powder shake? And if so, is there a certain type of protein to basically be aware of versus, because there's different types of protein, because I do want to lead this into one of the other questions that is, is a plant-based diet, which I, I, I'll ask separately, but really best time to take a protein shake and what type of protein should you take? Well, yeah. I mean, if you, if you wanted to say that there's one best time for a shake, right, I would say it would be around workouts. And, and again, I like before as well as after uh, as workouts. And, and again, if you, if you look at the research um, and again, we can get back to, um, the research on the anabolic window, right? You've seen a lot of uh, talk about, oh, there is really no, you know, anabolic, you don't have to eat, you know, around your workouts. It's not important. You know, there was a study done that showed that when they waited 24 hours to feed subjects after a workout, right? They got their protein, they waited 24 hours, okay? The protein synthesis spike was just as high 24 hours as it was, you know, immediately, immediately after, right? And okay, sure, that, that, that's real data, that's real research. However, these were beginners. These were, these were people who didn't train, okay? When you look at that, that, that research group's follow-up study, they had these subjects trained for, I don't know, eight weeks or somewhere around there, eight to 10 weeks. And then they measured it and they found that that, window was now down to eight hours. It was no longer, but nobody talks about that. Okay. Because they don't follow the actual research. They just look at this one study and go, Oh, see, you don't have to worry about eating around workouts. You could wait up to 24 hours and still get a muscle protein spike. Right. But if they followed the re the research and were aware, they would see that that same group took those same subjects, did a second study where they just followed them after training for several weeks, and they found that that window was now shortened. So if a few weeks of training shortened that window to eight hours, what would a few years of training shorten that window to? Meaning, and, and we don't know, okay? We don't, and this is the other issue is, Pete, there are there's no money for research scientists to study bodybuilders. Nobody cares, okay? No, except a, a few small percentage of research scientists. Nobody cares about bodybuilders. Most of the research we have on protein synthesis and in in the way muscle rebuilds is from medical research, whether it's in burn patients, uh, you know, people with muscle wasting issues so we we sort of tweeze the data from there there's not a group of people going hey let's take a bunch of high level bodybuilders and see which diet produces more you can't it, it costs money to do research so that research isn't out there um but what we do know is in 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 milos will tell you from the application standpoint is that you Effing better eat. If you want to see results, you better damn well eat around workouts. And one of the earlier studies that, that I rely on is a study that gave subjects whey and creatine at two different times a day, either before and after workouts, right? 
way in, in creatin before, so a protein source in creatin before and after workouts or in the morning and at night, okay? And what did they find? They found that the guys that were getting the whey protein and the creatine before and after around workouts, right? You can say before and after, you could drink it during, whatever, as long as it's around workout time, doubled their muscle mass gains, doubled their strength gains, and they also lost body fat the, compared to the other group who didn't lose any body fat when they were taking it at morning, uh, and night. So again, okay. So, so again, I know I'm talking on a, I'm going off on a, a no. bunch of different rants no, here, tiny. but using research, it's, the best time. it's critical right. that you have protein around your work, around, around your workouts. And the best, the best protein to get would be a, a liquid source because by the, like Milos already started on this, by the time you eat a steak, and break it down. Your your workout's long over. Your that your window is long over. You've already missed it. By the time those amino acids start uh, getting into your into your bloodstream, so you need a liquid source. And again, you want to go with a whey because of its fast digestibility, it gets to the muscles quickly. But what we've found is that we used to say, well, you don't want to do a casein because it's too slow. However, when you do both, a whey and a casein at the same time, you maximize your results because you get that quick spike in muscle protein synthesis from the whey, right? But then the whey is too quick. It like comes up and then within, you know, an hour or two, it's already, it's over, right? Whereas they show that if you then have casein on top of it, which is a slower digesting, now what happens is you get the spike from the whey, but then you also get that maintenance of the muscle protein synthesis from the casein for, you know, longer, uh, the muscle protein synthesis to keep it turned on uh, for longer. And there's a couple of studies that actually show not just acutely muscle protein synthesis, but in people who are training in getting a combination of whey and casein that they build more muscle over time than somebody who's just getting a whey protein alone. That's beautiful. You know, <clears throat> again, music to my ears. Now, <clears throat> One by one, if I remember, uh, I'm going to go with the timing and anabolic window. I wow. promise you, missing anabolic window is like missing the train. Okay, you're not going to make it there. Can you I know, ask so. a question before you get going, Milos? Just because, and this is an all honest question. What is the anabolic window? Okay, so anabolic window is when uh, muscle is primed to synthesize more protein. You know, you, you give initiation and reason to grow, and now you're going to have to have a sufficient amount of nutrients and amino acids to be able to synthesize that protein. So put it this way, if you go to the store and you don't have any cash and you're right there and you want to buy all kinds of stuff, but you don't have a cash, two hours later, you know, when you get out and you're back home, somebody give you a cash, well, you couldn't buy things that you wanted to buy. We wanted to buy a muscle tissue, and we like were there it. ready, but we had no cash. So nutrients that we're supposed to have, amino acids, right? This is that anabolic window. And this is how uh, I want uh, people to understand, but uh, not to forget. First, importance of nutrient timing and anabolic window. When you say, oh, it's not important. Dr. Jim just mentioned that, yeah, there are studies that they, they claim yes, they claim no, and uh, they use grandmas and, and pencil necks and they, they do plantar flexion. And, no, I'm talking about Jay Cutler, Ronnie Coleman, Mr. Jim Stepani, that I put you in the same category because you are you know, really that muscular and, and uh, anabolic. I would, I would rather punch myself in the nose than miss my anabolic window uh, nutrients, right? And all my athletes, oh my God, you better. So what I would make sure that I see them take that pre-workout and, you know, post-workout for sure. And then I attach them. I, I, I made them write the journals because inspect what you expect. I want to know not just how much protein, but how you're taking it, right? And then around the training, I always call that anabolic phase of the day. We can have a 24 hours. We can have a fat burning phase if we need to burn fat. We have a maintenance phase just to maintain, put what we're supposed to, to keep energy balance, caloric requirement, nutrient requirement. But 
when is this training now this is that anabolic phase magic happens right here magic is not going to happen if you miss on your nutrients and you miss on your sufficient amount of protein and then creating glutamine, uh, uh, beta alanine, citrulline, you know, the, the, everything that they put into, this is right now a uh, magic time. Make sure that you have everything. So Dr. Okay. Stepani said that, okay, about uh, whey protein, comparing to the foods. Food, chicken, turkey, fish, beef, they all have a different uh, digestion and absorption rate. Beef, correct me if I'm wrong, it can go up to like 24 hours to be completely digested, which is like you're missing the train completely. Whey protein that uh, Dr. Jim mentioned is about 20, 25 minutes. So it's going to liberate all these amino acids within 20, 25 minutes. You're going to get them in the bloodstream, which I've seen back in the 90s. The reason why they were saying don't take too much just whey is uh, as doctor said, it's kind of too fast. So you, if you have a too much hyper amino acidemia, too many amino acids and a physiological preference still there is, we, we need glucose. It, 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 this glucose can be converted, the amino acids can be converted into the glucose. So what they were saying back in the day, and I'm not a scientist, but that was the notion. If you have a just way, just way, and a huge amount of way, some amino acids are going to use, be used as intended for building needs, but some amino acids are going to be converted into the glucose. Now, as Dr. Uh, Stefani said, mix it with a slower okay, source casein. Now you have a quick aminos for this right away, and this is going to be slower. So you are constant influx of amino acids, which I said at the beginning of the, of the podcast. I want steady amino acids uh, in the bloodstream. And when it's higher need and demand, you have it, but then you have it, you don't have a you know, hiccups, like you don't have a periods of time when uh, you don't have for a uh, uh, massive building, uh, massive protein synthesis. But anabolic window is real and you miss the window, you miss the train, trust me. So uh, as I said to you, Mike, before, Everything in life, and then training and nutrition and hypertrophy, we can maximize, optimize, minimize, right? If people are happy with minimal results and, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm good, I'm, uh, yeah, okay, it's minimal result. Then you bump it up, oh, no, yeah, this is optimal, optimal, optimal for who? Don't you want a maximal? So for me, this is where I came into the picture. Okay, if you're going to, train you're gonna exhaust yourself you're gonna try to stimulate you're already putting the time and effort into stimulation okay stimulus is there now feed the muscle feed the muscle with everything you need when you need it like i said don't go home and then get the cash you know what do you need a uh, cash at home you know you need cash when you can get something with it so in a bodybuilding in a training this is how it is you anabolic window is right here and i'm just gonna touch the subject uh, uh, if, if you let me with that hyperemia advantage right so a blood that is distributed maybe 10 percent in uh, our muscles right now as we are speaking right if you go there and do the squats for 20 minutes uh 60 of that blood is going to go down to our lower body right so and then we kind of have a muscle contractions muscle, you know work output uh, everything right so it's there. What can, how can we take advantage of that right now? Well, if, if uh, uh, blood is saturated with elemental nutrients, okay, muscle building nutrients that can make a difference, uh, performance-wise and uh, uh, appearance-wise, right? This is that anabolic window. So anabolic window, the way I, I look at it is time right before the workout when you prepare it, prepare all these nutrients that you're going to transfer and uh, be able to use it uh, during and then immediately after. And Dr. Stefani can say much more about this. Physiological preference of the body after the training for hours is to replenish what you just lost. So this is where muscle becomes priority. The only time during a day, 24 hours, that muscle is priority for the human body is 
right there in this anabolic window. Out of this window, if you get all these amino acids, you know, your body's gonna say, well, what should we do? Make this enzyme or hormone or bone or brain or, or muscle. Muscle is last one that is getting at that time. But during this time, pre, intra and right uh, post-workout, this is when muscle is priority, guarantee. This, this is my view. I don't have a study, but maybe Dr. Stefani can say something. No, I mean, exactly, you know, th that's exactly the point. I mean, think about you have more blood flow going to that muscle and those muscles are capable of taking up far more nutrients. Plus, those nutrients are not going to be diverted into storage as body fat at that time. So this is why you, you really want to maximize. And I know Milos does this with his athletes. They take in a shit ton of calories and protein and carbs around workouts because it's going directly to the muscle, right? Thanks to the greater blood flow. It's being taken up greater by the muscle, right? So it's replenishing what it needs and it's not going to fat storage. And, you know, no getting back to the research study that, that claims and the experts that claim there is no anabolic window, that is a irresponsibility why when you after you have a tough workout you, you if you've done it properly you feel like shit right what makes you feel better eating getting in some carbs and protein and even some fat makes you feel better so why i don't understand why any nutrition expert any exercise science expert would say oh don't worry about it just eat when you can. Like you're, you're an idiot. I'm sorry. You're an absolute idiot. If that's what you're telling people, you're, it's irresponsible to misinform people that way. And you have no, no clue about human physiology. And, and again, you, Milos and I are talking about athletes who want to get the maximal benefit, but even for everyday people, why would you want to feel like crap after you work out and not eat? It doesn't, it just doesn't make sense. You know? And so when you're talking about the anabolic window being open, the time that it's probably the most open for your body to readily, for instance, uh, and, and we don't have to go down the rabbit hole just yet because there's a few other questions I want to lead into. But to Jim's point, you know, I remember, you know, even Rogan talked about this, about, you know, um, like a Gatorade, for instance, you know, something that is, you know, dextrose, a fast digesting carb you know, taking it while you're exercising essentially is, is being used differently than like sitting on the couch, drinking a game. Precisely. And that's because the anabolic window is open during, ex you know, during and after exercise. Yeah. And, and, and to put it in the physiological terms, just so it's not some anabolic window is like what Milo said, you have more blood flow going to the muscle. So there's, there's, the highways are open to take those nutrients to where you want it, to the muscle, right? The highway is open now, right? There's no speed limit. It's the freaking Autobahn at this time, okay? You don't get that the rest of the day. And secondly, the, 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 the windows are open. The, the, the ability for the muscle tissue to take up those nutrients is, is, is increased, okay? You, you're, you're not even as insulin dependent on getting glucose into the muscle. It'll take it up regardless of whether insulin is there at that one time when, it's, right. when it's been, the muscle has been fatigued. And three, those nutrients aren't going to be stored as fat at that time. There's far less chance of that. So why? Like I said, and you feel better on top of it. So why would you not want to take advantage? And, and that, one of the tricks that I tell people who are trying to lose massive amounts of body weight, right? we're not talking about body unless the bodybuilder is trying to get shredded for a show, right? Is, okay, if you're craving something, I don't care what it is, even, even if it's pizza, even if it's got some fat in it, eat it after you work out because... <laughs> Because the, the, the majority of those nutrients are going to go to the muscle and, and replenish what you've depleted. They will, the, the less chance of them being stored is body fat. So if there's some favorite cheat food that you have, like I said, whether it's pizza, pasta, whatever, a burger, whatever it is, right? If your goal is 
trying to lose body fat, eat that food right after you work out. The, the yeah. risk of it being stored as body fat is far less than if you just ate it at, the, you know, at some random time of day. I really like your analogy, Jim, and I think that you and I need to do a video specifically on that. Like but the highway's the open, highway. yeah. Because yeah. yeah. to me, that makes so much sense from someone who, and I still consider myself the uninformed consumer. I try and stay in that lane all the time because I'm thinking about ways to explain to just somebody who walks in my office for the first time or I see on the street. So if I may kind of reiterate and correct me if I'm wrong, it's like, the anabolic window opens when exercise is being performed, when most of the blood is being uh, delivered into the muscle that's being worked, right? So when you're exercising, let's say biceps or legs, okay, Milos, legs or chest or any, any muscle that you're, you're working on that day or a combination of muscles, the blood is going to go in into that, those areas, so to speak. And so that essentially you know, opens up the anabolic window and you want to make sure that blood is carrying the nutrients, whether it's protein or whether it's carbohydrates or in many cases, and this really dives into the pre-workout stuff. It's because I see a lot of these pre-workouts where I'm going, those aren't nutrients, those are stimulants. So you want the pre-workouts with the creatine, with the amino acids, with the beta yes. alanine. Yes. You want these nutrients because stimulants don't get into the bloodstream. Nutrients do. So if you want to grow muscle, increase strength, recover, you got to be taking these supplements, protein being the main supplement that you want to take to, to, to fuel the body with the nutrients that are going to help you build muscle. Because obviously, if you're working out, you want to build muscle. You want to build muscle, lose body fat. So having that highway open, well, you open the door because you start working out. So when that blood is getting off, going into, hey, let's go to the party for muscle, it better contain some nutrients. Yeah, exactly. exactly. And I know we're talking about macronutrients here, protein and carbs, but like you said, it's the same for beta alanine. It's the same for creatine, right? These, this is the time that those muscles are going to get that, those, that, the creatine. They're going to get the beta alanine and, 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 and take it up. And that's when you're going to get max. And, and like I said, that's why I have pre-gym and post-gym so that you're getting it both before, like Milo said, when you're prepping for the workout, right? And then you have it after. And, and, and again, you could take it during, you know, I, I, oftentimes I'll make my uh, pre and post shake with the pre-gym, the post-gym and the protein in one shake, start drinking it before and all the way through my workout and after to maximize the number of calories I'm getting, the amount of protein I'm getting, the amount of carbs I'm getting, the amount of creatine I'm getting, the amount of beta alanine I'm getting while that blood flow is surging to the muscle while the windows of that muscle are open and are able to take in more of that nutrients, right? It's, it, it, yeah, that's, that's exactly, I, but know, uh, one huge point, every muscle contraction opens up the cell and it's ready for uptake mm. of whatever is there. If it's nothing there, if it's empty blood, emptiness is going in. <laughs> You know what I mean? So yeah. that's why I said, don't send empty blood. Well, Milo, the blood. You said something to me, an analogy that I've kind of taken on to describe it, yeah. um, which resonated with so many people who I've talked to. And you said, you know, Mike, why, why would you take a, an airplane from Los Angeles to go to, to Australia without any fucking passengers? The passengers are the nutrients. You said, why, why make the trip? Right. So yeah. well, I, what's the point? <laughs> yeah i like your Basically, accent <laughs> the takeoff is the blood yeah. getting into the muscles the route yeah. is the anabolic window opening to get off ramp and carry those nutrients into the muscles into, into, and yes. you want to make sure that you have in gym this is why I love, jim it just goes back to you know this is why i i love learning because i still feel like i'm learning because then i can go back and look at like things that you've done which is like you also want to make sure that the right nutrients are aboard. You don't want any of that are going to fight with one another or have a bad synergy yeah. and cancel the flight altogether and get kicked out, right? I mean, so there are synergies and, and better type of ingredients that can be used to get a better result, yes? Like the form. Yeah, well, like those, we're talking those. about, you know, the whey protein and the casein, right? You want both right. of those, you know, both of those forms. 
Right. Yeah. Right. You, you mentioned something that I, I can jump in and uh, Jim said, uh, yeah, he used also glucose in in the training. You said that uh, Rogan mentioned Gatorade, right? And and yeah. this is this is the thing that uh, I do want to say because with the, all these keto diets and no carbs and all this stuff, yeah, 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 carbs. No, no, no. Listen, uh, uh, even though cellular energy is ATP, right? Uh, we know what each tissue uses. So muscle tissue uses glucose. So when you when you look at those three energy systems, you have a phosphocreatine phosphogenic system, right? There's very little phosphocreatine in the muscle. So that ATP is super limited, okay? Then you have a, a, a glycolytic in the, uh, uh, the oxidative, uh, oxidative uh, um, uh, energy systems. Oh, God, I, I lost my chain of thought. So you have a three energy systems, but you can use glucose. Yeah, you're preaching you know, phosphate, glycolysis, yeah. and oxidative, right? Yeah. Everything is depends, you know, high intensity, and then you continue, you know, eight to ten seconds, you have a phosphocreatine. Okay, that's it. Right. ATP is being yeah. used. But how and fast can glycolysis, ATP, yeah. okay. and, uh, glycolysis is in the uh, uh, oxidative uh, rate? But uh, how much ATP do you need to uh, resynthesize? How much? It's a crazy amount. Now, if you consider that muscle is using glucose, and uh, glycogen is stored. Okay, glycogen is stored. That's that uh, glycolytic uh, uh, system. But then you keep going, and uh, a rate that glucose is being used maybe would exceed the glycogen capacity. And I have a bodybuilders that we train when we do this carb depletion, carb loading systems. So you already have a glycogen uh, depleted into the next two or three workouts to just empty the tank completely. Right, you relied on the glucose. So now, why would you get with that Gatorade or dextrose? I use dextrose always because for me it's a nonsense. Okay, that uh, if I want to be uh, told what they want me to hear, uh, the this high molecular weight glucose polymers have a favorable osmolarity and faster gastric emptying, and it's by all means. Uh, superior to to dextrose and you're gonna get hold on a second what are we going to get we are getting a uh, glucose okay Mo monosaccharide one more glucose well dextrose is glucose. glucose yeah so you are getting what you're supposed to be getting it just has to go from here to the blood okay it takes three minutes to make it to the bloodstream you know what I what I know of but anyway, why would you put anything else other than dextrose, you know, for the duration? If you need increased glucose levels, right? And this is a time that you should, this is when you take. You mentioned, I didn't, I didn't listen to Rogan talking about Gatorade, but Gatorade science is what, from 1940s? <laughs> and uh, from 1940s, they put the glucose and electrolytes you know, for the working muscles of the athletes, right? It's just in a weight training, we utilize dramatically much more glucose because our training intensity and volume and everything requires much more. So to be a little bit technical, if you look at the normal glyce glycemia in the body, it's what, 70 to 90 milligrams per deciliter, right? That, that would be like normal glycemia. Multiply this with the five liters of blood, it's five grams of glucose that is in the blood, right? Five, nothing. So it's like, oh my God. So what if you drink that uh, Gatorade? It's normally 12 ounces is like 30 grams of uh, glucose, right? Or what I recommend sometimes to my athletes, take even more, 50 grams. And, you know, so what mm -hmm. kind of hyperglycemia that would create? But at a time when this is happening, muscle contractions are going on uptake of the nutrients is there. You have a hyper amino acidemia, hyper glycemia, and hyper insulinemia because that glucose is going to cause insulin release on top of it, even though it's not even dependent. You know, when you train, you can get away with uh, uh, anything pretty much. And that's, uh, on that note, I want to say to, to Dr. Jim, I did everything, this, as you said, the same for my athletes. You crave something, 
post workout, you can get away with the murder. Okay. <laughs> so you crave, <laughs> you crave something post workout. Of course, I would always uh, imply more on a carbohydrate of choice. So it, it would be more like a pancakes, cookies. Sure, of course. You know, pizzas, yeah. Yeah, rather than uh, fats. But uh, uh, when when they crave pizzas, they can say, okay. I'm going to kill you on a leg workout, uh, whatever. And then the post-workout, you can get away get the with pizza. it. But this is, this is post-workout. Intra-workout, right? Intra-workout here, when all this happens, I highly recommend dextrose. And I was telling you, Mike, take uh, half of the pre-gym, pre-workout, yeah. and then half of the pre-gym, not, uh, you know, now we have X, uh, Interworkout, but add dextrose. Okay, so so now you're gonna have all this betaine and citrulline and uh, uh, creatine, you know, isocyanosylvalin. Uh, everything is gonna be there, right? But this dextrose is gonna spike up the insulin even more, right? And uh, it, the the transport is gonna be even greater. So if you sip this in between sets, whoo, that's your anabolic window that. If you ask me, this is gonna uh, maximize even more. So with dextrose or without it, if we would do the research, I, I wouldn't bet my life, but I would bet a considerable amount of money that with the dextrose is gonna be uh, higher markers. I think they would be, uh, you know, more maximized. You know, so Definitely. I understand. That, uh, I, I don't know how Dr. Jim thinks about that one, but. Uh, uh, I, I think that well, that's uh, why we make a dextrose product. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know how Jim, I you, you know how I think real. about that. Yeah, Jim. So you know when we originally started, your big thing was to kind of create this gym system. You know because I you know my my, my two questions I was going to ask you guys, but you pretty much already answered them. Was you know from a consumer standpoint, it's okay. I hear all this. I hear what should be in my shake before I train, right? And then what should be in my shake after I train? Um, I've looked at that is because Jim has always talked about and he taught me about these uh, supplementation pillars. You know, you got to look at, okay, the, the ingredient, call it protein. Okay, that's, that's the ingredient. Then you look at the form. Well, we want to use whey protein isolate. We want to use whey protein, uh, or excuse me, in, in, in casein. That's the form of the different types of protein. Then how much? What's the dose? Um, and then the synergies. What are those synergies between the two? One's fast, one's slow. And then what's the timing? Take it before, take it after. And every product that we've done, Jim has formed, uh, Jim has done, but the organization is on from a formulation standpoint. We also had to look at like, what is probably the easiest approach for consumers to consume which would be both pre as well as post. That's probably the time in which, you know, they're going to take a shake and then do the workout and finish a shake. Some aren't going to have a, you know, a tub of protein or a tub of dextrose or whatever, like in their bag and do it mid workout. Um, so it was like practical application of use. Um, but uh, what, what is with the gym system, Jim, um, some people opt not to take the dextrose. They just take the pre and the post. Uh, is there a real detrimental benefit uh, or, or, or is there a real detriment to not taking the dextrose with, you know, all the other nutrients, both in, in, in the pre-gym, pre-workout, and the post-gym, post-workout? And let's say you just don't take the dextrose. What What is the, is it, is it good, bad, or you know, is there a major difference? What is yeah, I mean, you, you know, you know, and I tell people this, look, you can, if, if it's easier for you to drink the dextrose, drink the dextrose. You could eat gummy bears, right? Same, same type of thing. And, and again, you know, there's some sugar in there, which we can get into fructose and fructose has to go through the liver. So it's not as, as quickly delivered as pure dextrose is. Remember, like, Milo said, dextrose is glucose. What is your blood sugar? It's glucose, right? If you consume your what's in your blood sugar, it literally, within minutes, gets into your bloodstream and is delivered to the muscle tissue. So optimally speaking, you'd want to do the, the dextrose, um, A, to replenish your, your, 
your the carbs that you're using. And again, you could take the dextrose after, you could take it during, right? You want to take some carbs before. Um, and I typically would recommend for most people like something slow digesting before. But again, you could do dextrose before as long as you're also drinking it during so that you don't get, you know, you yeah. don't get the, you don't get those, you know, uh, drops. Cause you know, if you take a bunch of dextrose, right, you're going to get a huge insulin spike and then it's, your muscles are going to take up the dextrose and then you're going to be hypoglycemic. Right. So I would typically recommend, and again, there's a n million ways to skin a cat, right? I would recommend like uh, apple, say pre-workout, you're getting both glucose, you're getting some slower fructose, right? And then the dextrose post-workout. But you could go with the dextrose pre-workout. However, you'd want to also drink it during and after, right? So what are the benefits? Well, A, you're providing that quick energy source that you're going to need for, you know, a typical bodybuilder style workout, right? We're not talking about going in and doing sets of three to five, like a power lifter. We're talking about destroying the muscle with, you know, 10, 12, 15, 20 rep sets, giant sets where you're not getting any rest between four different exercises, right? That, that muscle needs the, the glucose to keep going and, and, and for you to stay strong and have the energy uh, for the workout. So, uh, is there a detriment to not taking it? And, and, and let's take the question as having no carbs during the workout, right? Because a lot of people right. think, oh, well, you know, I'm trying to lose body fat, so I shouldn't have any right. carbs at any right. time of day, right? Wrong, right. wrong. Like I said, the, the highway is open, right? You're having more blood going to the muscle. The windows of that muscle are open. They're now taking up more. So that's the, like you said, that's the one time of day that you want to have that sugar it's it's simply sugar and, and we're talking about dextrose here right to a keep the muscle fueled and to replenish it after the workout in fact one of our um challenge winners um elma elma Faria, right who was o very obese before she started the challenge right lost how, how many uh, incredible amount of body fat in pounds, right? She was using the dextrose. Okay. She right. was using dextrose again with her post-workout shake because as, as, as I said, you know, in, 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 you know, you can talk about the theory of it, but you know, we have thousands and thousands of people who've shown that this is true. She didn't, she lost body fat despite drinking sugar. Okay. And, you know, right. and I have all kinds of people, nutrition experts trying to tell me I'm, I'm an idiot for recommending sugar. It's not healthy, you know, or, or people, there's even people who understand the physiology. It's like, okay, I understand that you're, you're giving what's in the blood, the blood glucose, but isn't there a healthier way to do it? And it's just like, it is healthy, okay? There's nothing wrong with glucose wow. around workouts because, like I said, that's the time that the muscles are going to take up that glucose. It won't be stored uh, as body fat. So, again, so, yes, there's a detriment in not getting uh, glucose or some equal form of carbs, like Milos was saying, maybe, maybe it's pancakes. Like I say, maybe it's gummy bears, right? You want to be doing that around workouts that is the that is if and it's even if you're on a low carb, if you're on a low if you're on a low carb diet let's say you're on extremely you're eating half a, a half your a gram of per pound of body weight the one time of day you should be eating carbs is around your workout yeah absolutely because i think because i think what happens is is I've, I've run into this with with folks coming in and out jim is i'll tell them you know, make sure I'm like, what's the difference between, you know, the dextrose and, and, uh, and that's where the difference is. And, and I say, well, you know, this basically allows these nutrients to, you know, get into the muscle tissue and do its job. Yeah. And, yeah. and that's the other thing is right. You're spiking, you're spiking insulin. And again, you right. know, we hear all this talk about people going, Oh, you should never spike your insulin. Well, yeah, most of the time of day, if you're sitting on the couch, you're sitting in your office for eight hours. That's the, not not the time to get an insulin spike. But around your workouts, that's the the time that you actually want to spike your insulin because 
it, it not only is it an anabolic hormone, but it's helping to drive more of those nutrients into the muscle. And if you do it when you're sitting on the couch and you have an insulin spike, the ramp is closed and this just gets converted into fat. Basically. Sugar. That's okay. exactly, exactly the, the biggest point that you guys just said. Insulin can be your best friend and your worst enemy. Right. And if you always look at it, it's a worst enemy, worst enemy. Throughout the day, when you don't need it, sit on the couch, you spike the insulin, for sure, uh, it's an enemy. Big time. Right. Yep. That's where right. we get it. But as uh, uh, Dr. Jim said, it's anabolic hormone. We talk about anabolic window. Do we want something anabolic in anabolic window? Of course we do want it. So it's, here is when it becomes your best friend. So shoots the glucose level, glucose level, insulin is uh, released, muscle contractions are happening, and post-workout still your preference of body is to replenish all that. Here, your insulin is the best friend. So the lady that you just mentioned that won the contest, even though she was obese, she was taking a post-workout. Yeah, she was replenishing her glycogen, muscle glycogen. Yes. And therefore, you know, she didn't have, probably with most of the people have, when they over diet, they don't take any carbs. So the glycogen level is uh, very, very low. They reduce the fat intake and then protein. Is so now that protein is going to have to be converted into glucose. And, uh, you know, so now they don't have enough protein to yes. maintain the muscle mass. So metabolically active tissue is so low. Now they're losing weight, but they're also losing muscle. And uh, the, as you know, it's a yo-yo diet is never going to work. So she replenished the glycogen. So she had some energy, you know, throughout the day because of it. Insulin, and like you said, uh, her, all her protein can be maximized for protein synthesis to build muscle. But it's, yeah. Uh, for me, it's the biggest way to see that protein is being converted into glucose. I mean, if it happens, okay. Sure. But that's very expensive fuel. It's, right. uh, it's nonsense. Yeah. So you don't put the cash into the furnace to heat the house. You know, you're supposed to yeah. use the cash. And, and the other for, thing uh, with... The, with restoring your muscle glycogen is that glycogen pulls water with it. Yes. So the more glycogen you have stored in your muscle, the more water it's going to pull in and the bigger the yeah. muscle is going to look. Yeah. It's uh, what, what is it like 2.7 milliliters per gram of glucose, something like that. So if you store like a 500 grams of glycogen, it's like one and a half liters of, uh, yeah. Uh, so, we use that in uh, for bodybuilding uh, competitions to, like you said, to look that fully, you know, hydrated, uh, skin bursting. Exactly the, right. The, the carb deplete way. before and then yeah. carb up. Super complicated. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, but just to to summarize, you know, something. Okay. Number one, the biggest thing that we want to say is one gram of protein per, per pound for humankind one and a half for the athletes and up to two grams for all the strength athletes, for sure. I did it, I promise you, for 20 years, you know, when I was competing, you know. So protein is the, the base. Now, anabolic window, should we have it? Should we exist? Does, of course it exists. You can be, how can you be ignorant to say there is no anabolic window, okay? So it is. What you supply your body with for pre, inter, and post, this is that anabolic phase of the day. You succeed here, you, you are maximizing. You compromise here, you know, you are minimizing. So, yes, if you ask me, Mike, for that, for that thing, uh, should glucose be used? Yes, I do. You, you ask if it's detrimental. Okay, I had an argument with one expert. He goes, Milos, you can ride a car even with a half a gas tank. You don't need to have a full, right? <laughs> okay. Yeah, I say I understand that. Yeah. So physiologically, yeah, if your body, you know, that glycolytic system, it can break down the glycogen and give you the glucose. But when the glucose uh, uh, need is tremendous, and I'm going to tell you, uh, you know, uh, Charles Polykin, right? The strength coach from Canada. Uh, Jim, you met him before, and uh, yeah. Love Charles. First time when I started discussing with him uh, things because he does a lot of research. He goes, "Milos, how much glycogen do you think you burn in a you know 
one of your heavy workouts, which is hour and 15 minutes or so. And so I don't know. I can estimate, you know, maybe 75, uh, you know. You know so. No, he goes 200. Like, oh. And then he actually, at the time, he showed me all this, some research, like, hold on a second. You can burn up to like 200 grams of glycogen. I said, well, so what Charles was doing for his athletes, he would give them 200 grams of dextrose immediately post-workout. Huh. Okay. So he, that's what he would do, right? And I, I do even remember when the first time I, I said, like, oh, man. But, okay, why would you not distribute this 200 grams when it's being used and you can get all these other potential benefits? So initially he was strictly against it because I guess in strength, strength training is not beneficial. But then he admitted even and he wrote about it that I was always right, right since the beginning when I was telling him in early 90s, you know, for hypertrophy, glucose intra-workout is hugely beneficial and it would maximize so can you do it without it yeah i know that still some ketogenic people are not going to want to have a dextrose in the pre-workout you know they're gonna they, they, they prefer that way i would just say ketogenic diet if you, you want to use the ketones you know for energy source okay uh you're gonna lose some body fat but uh are you gonna lose some muscle 100 percent guarantee so why don't you just switch and have a anabolic window, workout window? That's when you can use here's, here's carbs food. right now, even on a keto diet. So in other words, even though you're keto, you can essentially take this during your workout, and it's It'll not still be keto, keto essentially. Yeah, because yeah, that's the thing too. Is some people have come in, Jim, in Milos, and they've said, "Well, you know, I'm 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 low carb, and and why would I want to take so much sugar?" And I try to explain them, like, look your body is in a different state, you know, there's pre-trained state during post, like there's that you're, 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 you're either, you know, walking into a room, turning on the light switch. I didn't use the off ramp, which I'm stealing by the way, Jim, we're going to, we're going to run that through the gauntlet. Cause I think that just, it opens up the consumer's minds because I think that's one thing that Jim, you've done so well. And Milo, she's been talking with you. You're a king of analogies too is just talking about nutritional aspects of supplementation as opposed to, you know, bullshit. And I think that's what we're fighting against because there's no vetted sources of information that allow an average consumer to distinguish between the two anymore. And because they don't have the knowledge that is present here with you two um, from, you know, the scientific and practical application standpoint, Milos, you're working with athletes every day at the highest level so you're seeing it firsthand. There's very little opportunity for the viewership to understand the wealth of knowledge that exists just in this very conversation. But I don't want it to distract them away from getting it because they feel intimidated by it. So use utilizing things like what you said, Jim, with the on and off ramp. I think those are the keys to getting this message out there. And then more importantly, being very specific and direct people to this is just what you need to take and here's the tool to take it and i think that's what this brand has you know really tried to do and it's been my goal uh specifically with jim for <laughs> all the years we've been doing this is to translate that message that has started in here and even beforehand all the way to what's in here and and that's the thing is that jim you were talking about these ingredients 20 years ago and, and there was never a tool to take. So when you talk about getting nutrients in a pre-workout, not a stimulant, and I see that every day with what we're up against in the marketplace and what consumers have available to them, you walk into your local GNC or vitamin shop and it's just, I mean, I would be confused even by today's standpoint of what I even know. If I wasn't involved with y'all and I didn't have the opportunity to be here with you, uh, today I would be confused, like just uh, grow and, and, and beast mode and then whatever all these different terms and, you know, uh, you know, Bambi brand, you know, the, the, <laughs> you know, all these other things. It's like, just tell me what I need to take. So my last question is we can talk about the benefits of the protein, how much we need to take, when to take it, the type that we need to take. I think we've covered that. Um, I'm 
24 years old. I'm 40 years old. I'm getting back into the gym for the first time. It's been a while or it's new to me. What's in my shake before I train? What's in here? What needs to be in here before I train? Well, you may need, you may need two shaker cups unless you want to mix it all together. But uh, definitely, you want to do a, a, a protein. Um, and like I said, you could either do whey. But again, with the whey, like I said, it's so fast that if you're going to go with just whey, let's just say you just like the flavor. Like you know, we do a whey isolate, right? And we have fruity flavors: the grape, the watermelon, which are amazing, right? You, you want to, if you, if you don't like the more chalky, like, you know, and, and again, our proteins are our pro gym, which is a blend isn't chalky, but it's more of that dessert flavor. But if you right. want something that's more fruity and light and refreshing around workouts and you go with just like a whey, like the, our grape, or like I said, our watermelon, um, our green apple whey isolate, then what you want to do is you want to continue drinking that throughout the workout, right? But you definitely want a protein, okay, before you work out. Okay, then I recommend branch chain amino acids before you work out because, again, most people think branch chains, they only associate with leucine, turning on uh, mTOR, which increases muscle protein synthesis. Yes, leucine is the key to turn on mTOR and increase muscle protein synthesis. But leucine doesn't act as an anabolic driver before or during the workout. Leucine only acts as an anabolic driver after the workout's over, okay? Before the workout, your branch chains are supplying an energy source, okay? And the thing that's unique about branch chains is that whenever you eat something, whether it's fat, whether it's carbs, whether it's protein, it goes to the liver. After your intestines absorb it, right, take it up, it goes directly to the liver. The liver is the master and decides, okay, it's like, the bouncer, if you and, will. Right. And, 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 uh, and, and Milos touched on this when he's talked about if you get too much whey, right, what happens to the amino acids? They get converted into glucose, okay? So a lot of times the amino acids you take you get to the liver, and the liver goes, you know what? That's great and all. Well, thank you for all these amino acids, but we need glucose right now. So we're going to break these down. Well, the, the, the branch chain amino acids get a bypass from the liver and they go directly to the rest of the body. And they go to the brain, they go to the, all the tissues, right? But they get a bypass. They don't get broken down and converted. They go directly to the muscles where they are used as an energy source. And also, like I said, I touched on uh, the brain, right? Well, they also go to the brain. And one of the branch chain amino acids, valine, Okay, so we know that our branch chains are leucine, isoleucine, and valine. Those are the three, right? And everybody just focuses on leucine. Well, before you work out, valine is actually the MVP because valine goes to the brain and it gets taken up preferentially over another amino acid called tryptophan. Now, what's important about tryptophan? Well, tryptophan, when it gets taken up by the brain, it gets converted into serotonin, okay? And what is serotonin? It's that feel-good hormone, right? That Which is great most of the time of day. But when you work out, what does serotonin do? It causes you to get lethargic and, and fatigued. Well, the valine stops that tryptophan from being taken up and converted into serotonin. So you have less serotonin, less fatigue, okay? So the branch chains are critical as an energy source and to prevent you from getting fatigued during the workout, okay? Then we can talk about creatine, right? Why do you want to have creatine? Well, you can argue whether to take it before or after workouts. I, like I said, prefer to take it both before and after so that it's, th it's there, it gets to the muscle, right? And during your workout, you're, you're keeping it supplied because, again, something that Milos talked about, the, you know, replenishment of your create you know fossil creatine system you want to keep that refreshed so that you have that immediate energy and then another thing i prefer is beta alanine and a lot of people say well it doesn't matter when you take beta alanine well yes and no 
I like it around workouts because again, like you said, there's more blood flow going to this muscle. So you're getting it to the muscle that you want. But the other thing we know about beta alanine is it acts as a, uh, not quite as much as caffeine, but it's a nervous, it's a central nervous system stimulant, a mild one. So would you take that before bed? You know, a lot of people have trouble sleeping when they take beta alanine at night. And that's because, like I said, it's a mild central nervous system stimulant. So why wouldn't you take it before you work out? You get a little bit of a bump in your drive, right? In your energy levels. And you're making sure that it's going to the muscle and blood flow is going to that muscle. And again, I then prefer to take another dose after of the beta alanine, right? And then another one that I want to take before is betaine, okay, which is trimethylglycine, okay. And what the research shows is that when you take betaine twice a day, and again, I go before and after workouts, because like you were saying before, when are you going to think about taking your supplements when you're randomly sitting around on the couch or your office or when you're getting ready to work out, right? Which is why I have it in, in, in pre-gym. I take it before you work out because again, it's when you're more conscious of your supplement regimen and you're going to have blood flow going to the muscle soon, right? So why not have it, why not have it being you know, digested and absorbed at a time when it's going to be going, blood flow is going to the muscle and those muscles are open to take in, in more nutrients, right? So those are the most critical things that I take before you work out. And then we can talk about if you want to do glucose, right? Again, if you're going to do glucose before you work out, you're going to want to drink it also during your workout. So I would make that shake for not just my pre-workout. Yeah, the dextrose, exact thing. Same, it's the same thing we just call we just we just call the form that we take uh, yeah. as as dextrose yeah. um but they're the identical um to take before you work out but you would also want to drink it before or if you don't want to do the the dextrose or glucose go with something like a, a piece of fruit where you're getting you're getting some glucose from the fruit you're also getting some uh fructose a little bit of fructose at that time is going to provide that slower uh slower longer providing uh energy source but again you want that protein right you want the carbs and then you want like i said those other nutrients would be branched chain amino acids creatine beta alanine betaine and then we can talk about a nitric oxide booster pre-workout if you want to do that which is going to further enhance the blood flow that's going to the muscle right what does that do it's going to help deliver more of those nutrients it's going to help deliver more oxygen to the blood flow, and it's going to help to deliver more water, right? And so with the water, once you start contracting the muscle, right, and, and creating waste products in the muscle, right, through the, the metabolism that happens, creates waste products, those waste products draw the water now out of the bloodstream into the muscle, and that's what creates a muscle pump. Now, not only do you look bigger during the workout with a pump, but there's also uh evidence that that pump stretches the muscle think about a water balloon right and it stretches the membrane and the evidence is that that stretch on the membrane causes that muscle to increase muscle protein synthesis because it's like oh we need more volume we need to be bigger to maintain that you know that push that's on that membrane we have to grow bigger even bigger so um so those are what, uh, I know it's kind of a lot there, but those are the things that I would focus on uh, getting in my shake before I'm ready uh, to work out. So I, so I wrote it down and obviously, you know, I'm kind of being a little bit, you know, ignorant on purpose here, <laughs> but, you know, protein, creatine, BCAAs, beta alanine, citrulline malate, uh, and dextrose. And if you add the dextrose, make sure you're drinking it into the workout. Precisely. Okay. Now, last it. question, just real quick, because you said protein, because people have this question. Is there any detriment to mixing the protein and the pre-workout together? Or do they have to be taken separately? Can they be mixed together? No, you can definitely take the, uh, again, our, uh, the, the way I designed those products, the, the pre-gym 
as well as the post gym, the pro gym, and, and even the ISO gym is flavors that can work uh, together. Now, typically you would think, oh, well, I'm, I'm going to do a chocolate uh, protein powder and a green apple uh, pre-workout or, you know, uh, you know, cherry limeade. Like, well, okay, no. But if you went with something like, say, say vanilla, right? If you went with a vanilla, which is why we have the vanilla and why it's probably one of our best-selling flavors is you could mix it with any of those pre-workout flavors and it's sort of you know it tastes like a you know like a smoothie if you if you will but those ingredients aren't going to counteract one another no no not at all Mila's so only agree. only in, and I mean, only enhance each other yeah it, it, it's uh you know great when somebody you know make the pay for you for your road i mean he said exactly my recommendations that I do for all my athletes for many, many years, but maybe to make a little bit more uh, uh, spicy for listeners, when you say, okay, we need a protein for uh, before the workout. Protein is what? Peptides of amino acids that is going to be uh, slowly or fastly because there is uh, some way, 20, 25 minutes, is going to be broken down into D-peptides, tripeptides, and elemental amino acids. So that protein that you're going to be taking, you know, uh, before the workout is going to liberate amino acids and they're going to be in a blood flow during a training. So this is our anabolic window. This is why Dr. Jim, you, Mike, and myself recommend you, you must have a protein, you know, before the workout. Okay. Now, pre-gym ingredients that everything is, you know, uh, masterpiecefully put in, into this betalanine, citrulline, creatine, uh, the, the betaine, uh, nitric oxide bo uh, boosters, you, everything is for a reason, okay? Right. We're right. going to increase blood flow. We're going to have a higher oxygen co consumption, cardiac output, blood flow, blood pressure, everything. This is going to be increased during a training. So during a training now, uh, this is possibility of maximizing everything so we have physiologically this happening and now nutritionally we have a nutritional bomb coming okay we have uh, all these ingredients that can make a tremendous difference the only thing that was missing right are you going to use a glucose or you're not going to use a glucose so dr jim recommends you can eat fruit like apple that is combination of glucose and fructose and so you're not going to spike the insulin before the workout, you don't really still need to spike it. You can right. ma maintain it. You just get some glucose going in the bloodstream. You don't want to. But as you start training, yes, in this uh, drink, I would in between sets. So you maintain glycemia. You know, on dextrose. Yeah, drinking uh, dextrose with a pre-workout. Half you can drink with your whey <laughs> and half you can drink with your uh, intra, right? So for me, this is now constant delivery and constant uh, anabolic uh, phase. Like, okay, you can insert everything into the muscles right there and then, right? Post-workout right now, again, you're still in anabolic phase. Okay, did you need the BCAAs there? Absolutely, you, you have them here. As Dr. Uh, Jim says, uh, one of the four mTOR uh, pathways, leucine, yeah, it's worthless really before. It's like uh, you're supposed to do the after. Would I do another scoop of BCAAs uh, post-workout? Yeah, for sure, because of that leucine. Um, the leucine. Yeah. yeah, now leucine becomes the MVP on the brand. MVP, yeah. yep. So here, I would again take a protein and I would do the combination. Uh, I don't have an answer. I don't know how Jim thinks. If it should be just whey, because there is still possibility that too much whey at once. Can yeah, be no, I would do a I would do a combo of whey combo. and casein okay, post workout yeah. as well. That's that's what I also say. That's why I also combo combo of fast and slow. This is just think about uh, window is really strongly one two hours. Uh, one first hour is the the most, even though they say even six hours after is being replenished. Come on. I mean, uh, you know, two, three hours later, your body switches. Yeah, bl uh, blood flow is decreased by then, yeah, so, you yeah, know, yeah, like. So in this one hour. So you need that post-workout uh, shake uh, for sure. 
combination of proteins. I would still do the BCAAs. I would do the um, creatine for sure, you know, uh, before, you know, uh, intra and post. I don't know your views on uh, creatine, but I was liberal just like everybody else before uh, with the protein, I doubled it. So I doubled my, my creatine back in uh, 97, 98, 99. And I'm, I'm not sure if, if you remember Jeff Feliciano, Dr. Wright, they were of all there when we talked about I it. I worked with them. So, so <laughs> I, I just, for a hell of it, I wanted to uh, go super high with the creatine and see what happens. And I used uh, creatine loading for my 97 uh, Canada, which I won in second place in Night of Champions. And I was bursting full. Okay, now, uh, I don't want to say that yeah, I can have a creatine storage that would make me burst in full, but creatine does retain some water and intracellularly. And when you are lean, you can appreciate it. So I, I would I, I would definitely take up to like 10 grams of creatine post-workout. <laughs> if, I, if I kill the workout, you know, if I really say, okay, this was a kick-ass, I award myself with like a 10 grams. If uh, it's okay, I would take a five, five grams. This, this is my, my gauge. Right, and that's creatine monohydrate. A creatine monohydrate, yeah. yeah. But the, uh, we, you, you we use creatine hydrochloride, which is absorbed much better, better than yeah. monohydrate, so you can go a bit lower, but you're uh, you're yeah. exactly in the on the right track right there. Yeah. So so that would be uh, you know basically our recommendations for for anybody listening to this podcast. You know, Mike, uh, Dr. Jim, and myself are all on the same page. Okay, during a day when you're gonna train, here is the magic that can happen. It's only up to you if you're gonna follow the rules. And have everything you need, as much as you need, at the time you need, which is pre, intra, and post workout. Uh, we are open for questioning. Uh, we, uh, this is not a noise. Like there is a lot of noise, is uh, nonsense. This is information that uh, we used collectively. Probably, what would we say, Jim? You're 55. You trained for 35 years at oh, least. Oh, at least, yeah. <laughs> yeah I've been training since I was a kid. Yeah. Yeah, we have a hundred years of training between us for sure, and and literally have helped millions, millions yeah. of people, uh, from the average Joe to Mister Olympias. So absolutely, um, <laughs> you know. Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's the most unique thing about this, and I'll kind of end on that, which is the wealth of knowledge that is within this brand. And, you know, I'm, I'm still somebody who's learning. So I'm not that guy who you go to, to get the information. I can only rehearse based on what I get from, from you, primarily you, Jim, you know, I've been working business partners with you for years, but I would say the consumers, if you're looking for a source, you know, and again, we are a brand. We obviously sell products. That is how we make a living, of course. But these products, selfishly, Jim has formulated for himself and for arguably me because there was a frustration that I truly had as a consumer and Jim not thrusting his philosophies on me while at the magazine as I annoyed him every day. What do you think about this? What do you think about that? And because I was like every consumer, and I still am, I live and die by the products that we take. I take them for myself, for my own results. I'm not the one who understands all the things that go on. I'm lucky enough to be able to ask you two guys what we've discussed here today. And my hope is that people who, you know, are listening and who have taken, you know, spent the hour 45 minutes with us to get to the point to where they've absorbed the knowledge is a takeaway you know, the information, which is the reason why we weren't saying this and this and this. We talked about the ingredients, the amounts, the nutrients. The, type, yep. the nutrients. And, and this and Jim is sitting there quoting studies off the top of his head, not looking and say, well, in my notes here, this, this gives credit to not only this brand, but these two individuals here. You have Milos, who has been training the highest level athletes at the bodybuilding and fitness and physique competition level in the world. And the 
And he takes them and makes them bigger and leaner. And how does he do that? With that, with the knowledge that we've just spoken about today, he would right. he wouldn't have the clients he does unless he produced the results. And and you know that's the thing is like, you could talk theory all day, you could talk about research studies, but at the end of the day, the result it's the results that matter. And I I beg you to find two individuals who have produced as many results in people as as the two of us have. So. <laughs> results Agreed. and, and it works. just so it you works. Know, just so you know at some point guys we're going to bring on the third person here into this conversation who once again is not the scientist is not the trainer of the bodybuilders who but i will say gunner peterson has joined our team and he is the if you want to talk about training the average person or the high level uh, athletes, the high level professional athletes and, and of all realms, literally yeah. all realms. Yeah. From a personal trainer standpoint, working with celebrities and athletes at the highest level, getting people in shape for movies or whatever, it would be Gunner. But he is now finally asked Jim and asked myself, why aren't we doing something together? So if you look at the trifecta of Jim's supplement science, 